Savior Para is brought to you by just a couple of words in the center room and um, no drill. Uh, our supporters provided by uh, Brackyard uh, Games, he wanted to be mentioned, um, as well as uh, viewers like you. Uh, and so with that, let's please enjoy the show. Hello, now normally uh, people begin this show or any radio show with an opening segment that may seem to be lackluster in some respects to some listeners. However, this is no ordinary show. This is a viewer paragraph. And of course, we will begin this show with a moment of drama. But a moment of drama, not just for drama's sake, but rather to illustrate a very important point. The scene is Washington State. The year is 2016. The fog drifts between the evergreens far from any human influence. Of course, what do we find here but nature's largest miracle? The birder. We join two birders hiking high into the forest which we love so much. Spotting a pine in the not-too-distant future, the birders peer through her scope. Spotting one. Two. No. Could it be? Three siskins. Is it a period of one? Two. Three moments. Is this a fairy tale or reality? You decide. The theme of this aviary paragraph is... Get out there and go for it. I'm Zan Mars. I am here, as always. I am. With me, uh... Or I have with me my two hosts, uh, who haunt the show upon occasion. Uh, I'd like to call him the Pied Peacock of bir Birders, uh, Martin Salinas. Uh, Birders, hello to you, Zan. Uh, Birders, hello to you, Martin. And of course, our ecological nut and friend of the show, Timothy Leckwe. It's a pleasure to be here, Zan. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Tim. So, hey there, y'all. Hope, hope you guys are finding yourself uh, good today. You know, do you find yourselves as well? You know, Zan, I'm just terribly excited about this episode because You've heard it from me before. I love uh, yeah. when people just get out there and go bird. Unfortunately, this is radio. Um, so you listeners out there aren't able to see Martin's face when he heard that this episode was going to be about getting out there and going birding. I mean, he was just... I mean, Tim, you, you were here. It was... It was a, a look of pure joy. Yeah, honestly, I, I feel afraid. sorry for all of our listeners out there that they couldn't just take a glance at Martin's face and just see, because his eyes, there was like a sparkle in his eyes when he heard that this... Turned turn my heart into a... a... So we're kind of getting in the, my, uh, in the mind behind the mouth on Martin Salinas on this one. Uh, I'm right here with you, Zan. Yeah. So, um, today we're going to be discussing Malheur closure coverage. We're going to review a brief book. Um, we're going to get the inside peep on the mind of the bird and the mind of the birder. We are going to do a little bit of bird trivia. And of course, uh, we're going to discuss getting out there and going birding. Zan, you always, as host of Aviary Paragraph, have such an exciting and riveting agenda for every episode. It is just hard for us to cram it all into an hour. Uh, how do you do it? Well, it's uh, exceedingly hard. Uh, let's just say I got a... I got a uh, good relationship with our producer um she we love anna glover we, we do we love anna glover over here yeah she's she's great and um she's been editing our show pretty much non-stop as soon as we um finish she's she's in the in the um room editing and pulling this whole thing together uh really uh fantastic work ethic you know. she's, she's you could say she's the brains behind uh, the brains behind AV, yeah. AV, 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 yeah. Yeah. but in a way she's also not the bird brains. brains no bird brains there 
Oh, wow. <laughs> did you just go there, Zan? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I did. So, um, today we're going to, like I said, we're going to, I think we should start with talking about getting out there and going birding. Uh, now, Tim, I'm not going to start with you because this is something that I think Martin is really going to know a lot about, except before we can talk to you, Martin, I'm just going to bring up one little short story here before we before we talk to you. So, recently I was uh, looking online on the internet, and I was uh, I happened across an article written by the Hindustan Times. Uh, apparently, an article, this was uh, updated in January 31st of uh, 2013, a rare migratory bird was spotted after 113 years in Himachal. That bird was the um, known for being silent uh, for most of its life, except at the moment of its death. The, it's called the Hooper Swan. Uh, now, you might be familiar with this, you might not, but I would like to uh, segue into this discussion on um, getting out there and going birding by saying um, we're going to do something new here, something fresh, Martin's editorial uh, column. And that uh, column is um, known as the Hooper's Holler. So that was just a clever way I decided to, to introduce your segment. I'm not sure if you're following that, but... You know, Zed, I am just uh, pleased as peaches to be able to be the first person um, to deliver my editorial column. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Hooper's Holler. Yeah, and that's a silent W on Hooper's. You, I did get that, Zan, yeah. uh, just as in the uh, hooping swan. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Well, Zan, being that this episode of Aviary Paragraph this week is on getting out there and going birding, yeah. I thought I would share this with you, Tim, and our listeners. Right, our listeners out there. You've heard me say it before, but today I'd like to let you, the Aviary Paragraph listener out there, Know a little bit more about just what I mean when I say, get out there and go bird. Birding is about escaping the humdrum of everyday life, mm. connecting with something bigger and more beautiful than oh, the daily grind. Okay. All right. I didn't, I didn't see that before. Birding is about, birding is about seeing things with fresh eyes, both new and old. One is silver, the other gold. Birding is about the friend you made chasing down a king eider that neither of you could find, but only the two of you know what happened out on that boardwalk that foggy morning. Kind of reminds me of me and Jason. So the next time you get out there and go, Bird, remember this. It's a big world out there, full of exciting things waiting to happen just around the next corner, but you might never see them if you don't. Bring a spotting scope. And as always, this is Martin Salinas encouraging you to get out there and go bird. Wow, that was a great um, uh, editorial there, Martin. I mean, I think that gave me sort of, uh, you know, yeah, I'd say I almost after I heard that, I'd say you almost have the gift of gab, as some people like to uh, point out about others. Because um, when I heard that, I, you know, you're, you're just, um, the words that you were saying the the words that you were saying they 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 sounded nice and then also they just had a, a lot of meaning behind them as well so well Zen is a as certainly as a fan of tenth century poetry um, I've always found that it is both important yeah. that the words sound nice but that they also have yeah. something else definitely definitely um yeah yeah I see that so um. Getting out there and going birding, uh, Tim. Do you have any sort of things that you'd like to say about that? Or well, I'd like to thank Martin for for that uh, that whoopers holler that we just heard right now. It was fantastic, and uh, you know, bravo. No, no. Yeah, Tim. I'm not entirely sure what um, what segment of the show you were referring to there. Uh, the one that you you just did. Oh, no! It's the Ho Hoopers. 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 Yeah, it's a silent W. It's a silent. Yeah. Tim, this is the first time I've I've done this segment. Yeah. Well, I gotta tell you guys. Um, and, uh, 
It's so not, a, not a great start, I, I guess. I don't call it Tim's uh, bookie corner. Yeah, that's true. He doesn't do that. Last, last time, actually, you guys kept on uh, trying to call it Tim's comic book corner. Well... Even though, you know, that's not the it, name of well, it. Well, but it was... You had brought in kind of an unusual like, book. It was a little different. It was yeah. uh, made out of a brown paper bag. Yeah, I guess. I guess yeah. uh, usually I some, reserve that material for yeah some brown paper bags or mist netting yeah. small uh, birds. I guess some people are just yeah. you know afraid of new things and uh, you know I, it's you know, it's scary. Say, I put you myself know, I in that. In that you, know. Um, you know, we put ourselves out here on Aviary Paragraph. Yeah. We don't always agree, uh, but there's one thing we love. That's that's birds. I'd say I'd say so. That's something we can all get behind. So pretty yeah, much, yeah. Um, I'd just like to add also, if you guys can get on the internet, uh, check out the Hindustan Times article. It's a great article on a rare migratory bird spotting event over in India. Um, definitely great that that Wooper Swan uh, came down to the Pong Dam Lake. Um, and I gotta tell you, DS uh, Dadwall, um, he uh, said that the bird is a rare migrant to India because it normally migrates over to Central Asia and Europe. That was uh, spotted in 2013. Um, so, essentially, why do you think people need to get out there and go bird? Do you think they're getting out there too often or not enough? Not, not nearly enough, um, in my opinion. But, okay. uh, you know, that's okay. that's just, you know, maybe some birders would say, you know, too many are out there. They want a little bit more privacy. Some people might see this uh, answer as controversial. Yeah, but, you know, those, in my opinion, those people are, are greedy. Yeah. You know, really, it's hard for me to say that anyone is getting out there and birding too much. Okay, definitely. Yeah, so you're kind of uh, taking the uh, angle of people should go uh, go go out there and go bird. Zan, um, it's just hard for me to say that anyone is getting out there and, and going birding too much. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that that some of this advice that you guys are touting about getting out there and go birding, um, for some of those uh, birders, uh, it could be detrimental to their family life. Um, you know, it could be... It could be um, detrimental to their friendships, their work, other things. You know, well, if, it, if it was my family, right. you know, I would, I would, you know, force them if they didn't want to go. Some birders are more cutthroat, though, right? Because, I mean, they might say, well, my son, um, my son has a weight issue and I, I can't bring him out here. It'll be good for him. Well, but maybe to slow him, slow people down, um, hit, uh, slow him, but slow the birder down to have the son there. Well, you know, you just gotta, you know, gotta really push the sun to just, you know, suck it up and walk faster. Okay, I see what you're saying. So, um, our next uh, big, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm saying um, uh, big because this was an important event. Uh, regardless of uh, whose side you're on, it was a pretty important event. We're going to be talking Malheur closure coverage. Mm. Um, so, I just received some breaking news from the Oregonian. They said that firearms, explosives, and a trench of actually, um, and for our adult listeners, um, if you please put your hands over a, ch a child's ears, there's actually a human feces uh, in a trench found at Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. You can now take your hands off the child's ears. Um, federal, the feds, federal government saying. So, I mean, is it over? Is it, you know, what's going on? You know, in many ways, Zan, this is um, 42 days, I believe, of occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really just on day one of recovery. Right. Because this, uh, this was, for our listeners out there who don't know, Tim, uh, could you break down the Amalia situation really briefly for us? Um, so, a bunch of uh, redne rednecks, basically, from out of state decided that uh, the federal government had no rights to any of the the land that they own and operate in the West, uh, which is public land. And uh, sure. they decided yeah. that uh, they would use the Malheur National Park as a, kind of a guinea pig location right. to take over uh, with... with uh, 
Oh, it was a no. It is a national wildlife. Oh, refuge. national wildlife refuge. Oh, yeah. Sorry, no, misread the uh, oh, no, 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 the uh, Wikipedia that. there. And that group of rednecks are—they are calling themselves the Citizens for Constitutional Freedom. But that's a great breakdown, I'd say, pretty much. Um, you know, you got the Bundy Bundy uh, clan, I guess, in there. The Bundy the, Boys. Bundy Boys. Um, we actually had a, an exclusive uh, aviary paragraph went to actually a um, protest, uh, or maybe it was a remembrance, uh, it's hard to say, uh, uh, for um, Lavoy uh, uh, Finnicum. Finnicum, yes. And um, I gotta say, uh, startling, a lot of emotions. Uh, uh, I was talking with protest coordinator he said there was no political stance over the protest was in front of the capitol building and um there were a lot of flags and guns and other stuff so sort of stuff i'm not used to i'm not a big uh, uh gun guy you know um you know and, and really if we could just kind of uh keep on that thought it, it certainly an organizer can can say uh this is not a political um, event, hmm. but the reality is when you have uh, active participating members holding signs that say things like uh, "Black Lives Matter" are terrorists, hmm. and the reverse of that sign uh, saying "Ranchers' Lives Matter," um, hmm. I think not only is it political, but it's actually trying to bludgeon its way into the political sphere. Hmm. Um, I like the word "bludgeon" because that's um, pretty accurate. Certainly, uh, it is in. Certainly it uh, is in, and, and additionally, I think there was cause for concern when we noted uh, at that event, uh, that political rally, a, a small group of um, white supremacists. Now, that was unfortunate, yeah. This, uh, what struck me was not so much that they were there, but the number of people who had brought their children to this yeah. rally. Yeah. And chose to stand on the steps of the Capitol um, for this rally. Yeah. Uh, all the while standing with a small group of white supremacists. I gotta admit, that had me spooked. Well, the people there, especially the ones with their children, I imagine, I hope, would distance themselves from the ideologies. You would, yeah. When talking about it. I think we see something very indicative of the problem when people choose to continue standing with these white supremacists. Yeah, I, I uh, see what you're saying there. That's a very uh, accurate uh, depiction of an issue that's ongoing with the um, citizens. So, um, now I will say, is it over? What do you think is next for these guys? Well, I definitely don't think this is the last time we're going to be hearing about this mm -hmm. in the news. Even though the the actual armed occupation is over, mm -hmm. there's still um, still an active crime scene at mm -hmm. the wildlife refuge, and the you know the right, feds just, are just found are that. going through and looking Jesus. for bombs and ammunition. But uh, definitely, as you know, further down the road, as these uh, armed occupiers begin to make their way through the justice system, we're going to be hearing more about this. Yeah, next steps? Uh, next steps, uh, you know, I think buildings are one thing, but the most important thing is, is really the displaced uh, conservation professionals that call Malheur their place of work. Um, these are people who had, uh, had death threats against them and their wow. families, wow. Yeah. Um, have been, uh, couldn't be in Harney County. For wow. this month yeah. and so certainly i think um just the the repair sort of the psychological uh repair and recovery yeah. that needs to take place with the workforce there is is going to be a big task yeah our, our heart goes out to all the uh those employees i'd say yeah. they're they they're the the real victims of this whole yeah. situation of having right. their lives interrupted more than anybody and i'd like to move with that point to my final question on all your coverage so everyone knows that the true victim behind this event is the birds now now are the birds are the birds out there, are they going to be able to uh, recover? I mean, are they going to migrate back to Malheur? Or, I mean, have they flown the coop 
permanently? Or what's going on here with the birds? Now, Zan, I know that there is some very active wetland management that is done uh, at Malheur Wildlife Refuge. In the early spring, mm. uh, a lot of water is moved into that refuge to make sure that there's adequate habitat. So, in many ways, I think that the removal of the armed occupiers uh, came kind of just in the nick of time. Mm. Uh, there was a, probably a lot of concern, I would imagine, that the uh, wetland management practices that had been ongoing there for a number of years were going to be uh, really changed in, okay. a, in a drastic way. Sh had those occupiers stayed uh, and, and been at the refuge when it was time to really start pumping that water. So, thank goodness it ended when it did. Yeah, definitely. Now, any uh, sort of speculations or uh, gossip you've heard about this? Uh, not so much gossip, but, you know, one thing that's really frustrated me through all of this entire debacle is, yeah. you know, through all for all the media coverage that this occupation received, very little, if any of it, was about the birds. That's and true. that very true infuriated too. me yeah. because that's, I didn't, you know, give a crap about, you know, any of the, these, you know, what's happening with these guys or, you know, what they're involved with before. But mm -hmm. for God's sakes, you know, what about the birds? Sure. Now, Tim, I did see a, a picture and I actually need to track this down a little research. You know, I've been slacking off a little bit on my homework here. Okay, right. um, I saw a sign of some uh, counter uh, protesters, people protesting the occupiers. Hmm. Uh, and on one of their signs, it said half of the world's population of Ross's goose. And I believe the implied message was half of the world's population of Ross's goose call Malior home. That's uh, that's phenomenal. I, for a second, I thought you were going to say that the sign said, get out there and go bird. And I was going to say, well, that, that, was, that would be... Well, seeing a sign like that, I got to tell you that it kind of makes me want to yeah. get out there and go bird. Know, right? they practically Half the world's the population in says, one place. I mean, if you're Martin Salinas, yeah. that's the way you read it. Yeah. All right, well, any final thoughts, Tim? Well, I think, um, you know, now that the spotlight spotlight has kind of been shown on Malheur. I uh, I hope and expect that you know once it's op back open for the public that it'll see a, a great influx of visitors wanting to yeah. see the spe spectacular migratory bird displays and uh, oh without a doubt you know perhaps aviary paragraph could uh, schedule. Uh, little field trip sometime hey, in the future. I wouldn't say no to that, you know. <laughs> that would be pretty nice to sounds go like, out there. Sounds know. pretty swell to me. Yeah, getting out there and going birding like that would be a real treat. So with that, um, I think we're going to take a brief commercial break. Uh, Tim, you want to take us out on this one? We'll be right back with Aviary Paragraph. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we've been talking a little bit about serious things, getting out there and going birding and malure, all that stuff. So we decided to get a little lighter here with Tim's Bird Book Corner. Now, in Tim's Bird Book Corner, um, we have, of course, Tim Lequeet. This is a different sort of episode. I'm going to have him uh, tell you a little bit more about that. But um, this week in uh, Tim's Bird Book Corner, the, uh, the focus is not so much going to be on a specific book per se, but more of a uh, story within the book. Um, sure. Really a fable. Yeah. More than a story. Um, I decided to go with a story that included a few birds. And okay. uh, this okay. this um, the story has several birds. So uh, the name of the story is... Now this is an interesting book, I gotta say. 
This is a it is very tiny. it is very interesting. The illustration in this book is that what attracted you to this originally? Um, yeah, I saw you know on Milo the Winter. on the cover there's a He's few really birds. Yeah. Um, there's a crow and what looks like like a rooster. Right. And that really kind of was the initial yeah. trigger to make me pick up the book in gotcha. the first place. Now this is not a Dover book. This is not a Penguin Press. Yeah. Now I'm I'm looking here and I don't actually recognize. This is a lesser known um. Publishing publisher right. company, yeah. beautiful, beautiful book. Yeah, yeah. You can you can hear the pages of this you yeah. know large book being turned. You can really press. you know smell the book, and you know it really yeah. makes me wish that you know this was I like on the ebook. I like that old book you know. smell, but sometimes you can occasionally get an old yeah, book I, from the library, and it just smells awful. It you know, really does. All I have to say is if you know if only this was on ebook. Yeah. Um. So the the name of the story is the um, is the the tortoise and the ducks. Um, okay. It's part of uh, um, the Aesop for children uh, with uh, pictures by Milo Winter. So this is Winter. for the younger young birders out there. This is for this is hopefully stories like this might inspire um, a child to become a birder. Maybe in their future. get out there and go bird. Yeah, develop some relationships with those birds. Getting yeah. out there and going birding. Start early. Yeah. Um, this, this story really is, it's about a tortoise, um... But I, re I really gotta add, this is a really wild book. I mean, I'm just looking at these illustrations, and they are just... So, so the illustration here, wow. um, shows, a uh, two ducks flying, okay. holding some sort of, uh, depicts two flying ducks over a cloud backdrop, holding a, uh, stick between the two no, of their No, I gotta stop you there, Tim. Because, uh, looking at these ducks, I think, uh, the birder in me just has to know, what kind of duck do you think these are? Now, m my first thought went to mallard, but I'm noticing the scapular feathers, um, don't seem to have that iridescence in them. Hmm. Other kind of distinctive field markings, we, we've got a pretty orange beak, a black eye with a very light uh, eye stripe, hmm. a white ring around the uh, base of the neck, mm -hmm. um, and what seems to be on primary number one, almost a bluish tint, as opposed to the, the remaining primaries, which are mostly black and brown. Rare bird alert. Any guesses? Uh, you know, I was... I was, uh... Originally going with the uh, mallard as well, but you know now that you that you mention it, um, you know it could be could be a couple different things. Uh, you know, I think we'd have to know a little bit more about Milo Winter to ascertain what sort of bird he's drawing here, because Milo could be from a foreign country. For all we know, you know Aesop's Fable that what was that from Greece or maybe Roman times or another place like that. Some sort of European bird. The devil truly is in the details. Let's leave it at that. So what's with this story, Tim? I mean, tell me more. You, you piqued my interest. So this tortoise, you know, he's a tortoise. He yeah. carries his house on his back, crawls around. He can, you know. Okay. But he, you know, he's, he went to a wedding. Um, and he's, Another case of anthropomorphizing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I noticed. I noticed similar to last week. Yeah. Um, but so he at this wedding, he sees these these birds flying gaily about in okay. the sky, and you know he just he he gazes upon them, feels you know a deep sadness, and you know he says honestly, I feel the same. I I feel that way. He wishes sometimes. he could fly, yeah. and so um, you know a couple ducks come up to him and. They say, you know, hey, what, what's going on? And he opens up a little bit. And they say, hey, we'll take you up. You'll see the world from a bird's eye view. And, you know, the, the, tortoise, That's a rare the tree. tortoise is so happy. So they, they hold a stick between their beaks and fly. And the tortoise hangs on to it. And uh, they're flying. You see in the world. See in the world and, a, and a crow flies by. And, you know, he, he says, this must surely be the king of tortoises seeing a, a tortoise flying through the sky okay, yeah. and the and the tortoise opens his mouth and says why why certainly and drops oh because he was holding dead. on to the stick he was wow. holding on to the wow. stick and and uh opened his mouth to say 
right. a few foolish words, and okay, yeah, he was dashed to pieces on a rock. Wow. No. Sort of sad too. Really begs the question. Let's let's Cautionary. dive into this. Let's yeah. tear it apart like an English major in their junior year. Okay. In my opinion, the the moral of this fable is uh, foolish curiosity and vanity often lead to misfortune. Wow. I mean, that is. Uh... What what do you guys think? It's very fascinating. What did you get out of it? Well, the tortoise to me, Tim, it it really kind of represents. Uh, the common man, the the person who carries with them feelings of responsibility, uh, feelings that they must do certain things in order to maintain their own safety and security, while the duck, the bird of the story, represents that freedom, that fancy free and footloose lifestyle that lends them to a life in the sky. What's so interesting about this story is that here we have the two kinds of lifestyles meeting Hmm. in a moment of sharing and kindness. Now that third element, the crow, I'm just not too sure. Zin, what do you think? Um, you know, I uh, thought that the crow, he seemed um, pretty nice. All the characters seem pretty nice in this story. I think the story was incorrect in that actually the only mistake that the turtle made was when he opened his mouth. He, it's it's he, although the physical act of open opening his mouth is ultimately what ended him. That opening of his mouth was triggered by a need to you know a, a vain need to to talk to this crow and say why well, yes I am I am the king of tortoises. Yeah. You know, no. praise be on to me. In, in in my eyes, Tim, I'm going to differ a little bit with your interpretation. I, I kind of think of the crow as a deceiver with malintent. Okay. Yeah. And in this case, the tortoise Interesting, is... because the crow is, in a lot of cultures, uh, have uh, stories about crows as the deceiver. I just thought I'd add that in there. Um, oh, thank you for yeah, that, Zan. Definitely. Now, our tortoise is not so much vain uh, in that I don't believe our tortoise thought of itself as the king. But when given that, when that was put onto the tortoise, uh, he simply sought to recognize it. So in this case, I think the burden of daily responsibility had caused the tortoise to lose his edge that is necessary Mm -hmm. for a life in flight. That fancy, free, footloose lifestyle, easy come, easy go. Uh, One that can respond to change quickly, can make quick, good judgments to stay alive. Hmm. A sharp-witted hero. Our tortoise was not that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stick with the experts on this one. Uh, definitely uh, sort of an interesting uh, cautionary tale there. Um, with a little bit of sadness. I didn't read it, so I'm, you know, I, I, I'm just going to leave leave it at that, I'd say. Uh, now, what um, is your rating of this? Uh, you know, you I would uh, I would give this, this fable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, on Amazon, I'd maybe give it a... Give it a four. Four on it. Well, yeah. Wow, I think that's just a... just because it was so short. You know? Sure. No, yeah, if they, if they, if they put this out on stories. ebook, would you give it a five? Would that bump you up to a five if it was on ebook? Yeah. You know, I think if I had the, I think you know one of the detractors for me was the you know the feel of and the smell of that paper. Yeah. You know, uh, the the I would have much preferred to enjoy this fable on my you know Kindle fire. personal laptop or tablet yeah. you, know, you know my my choosing yeah there i'm just looking online right now it looks like it is available on you oh, so oh my that is uh, fortunate so um well i'll have to uh log on later and yeah maybe purchase purchase that ebook yeah that's uh, that sounds like a good idea um, so I think we're going to do this uh, uh, next segment here now. Um, this one is going to be a good one, I think. It's a birding trivia segment. I think we all here at AV Paragraph really like that. <laughs> of the estimated 65 million people that are now feeding their wild birds, 
<laughs> Only a very small number of these people will actually ever get to enjoy the thrill of having a wild bird land on their hand and feed. Uh, with this one, this is going to be a trivia segment sponsored by FunTrivia.com, the trivia and quiz community. Um, this one's Birding 101, created by BenBen22. The user is BenBen22. And he's going to open this one up with a quote. Bird watching is a growing outdoor activity throughout the world. And I think that that speaks a lot to getting out there and going birding. Um, definitely birding has grown a lot. Um, you could say that birding used to be in its infancy, and now it's... Um, in its adolescence. In really. its adolescence, I'd say, yeah. So, uh, question one, and then we'll each get... I'll give you a couple options, and then you pick an option, and then... Um, yeah. Uh, what is the book that most birders carry with them on outings? Is it an outdoor survival manual, a dictionary, a field guide, or a bird handbook? Well, Zan, first I was thinking an outdoor survival manual because in many ways I think of my siblings, my field guide, as the only way I can survive outdoors is to really have that reference material uh, for ID those birds, but I'm gonna go ahead and go with uh, a field guide. Okay, and uh, Tim, do you uh, uh, do you have any th any ideas on that one? So when you first uh, listed field guide, that would have been my first choice. But then you said bird handbook, and I'm not I'm not totally clear on exactly uh, what what that is. Interesting. If that if there's a difference between. A bird handbook and a bird field guide, and is the is the field guide mentioned? Is that a bird field guide or is it, it some other type of field guide? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, that's a noodle scratcher, isn't it? Uh, you know, I I say that. Uh, you know, you know, I'd say our, <laughs> our book on uh, fishing. Um, you know, that we reviewed a, a few things ago. I'd say that is a birding handbook, but. Uh, Oh, and then, no, but, they're actually, but not necessarily a, a bird identification. I don't want to give right. away anything here, but there actually is a book called The Birder's Handbook. Oh. Uh, that's pretty, pretty famous, the well mouth, known huh? book. Yeah. Really? Do you know what it's about? Uh, it's actually a, a series of essays about uh, different groups of birds. It has a kind of yellow cream cover. Um, okay. Tall lettering and, and a variety of illustrations of birds on the cover. So, uh, what's your uh, answer on this one, you think? You know, it would be a pretty specific book for that many people to have on them. Uh -huh. I think I'm going to have to go with the field guide as well. Okay. And that's a good go because uh, you both got it right. That is, a field guide is the book that most birders carry with them on outings. Okay, um, and of course they're talking about the Peterson, the Sibley, the National Geographic. Excellent choice of field guide for birds. Even the Crossleys. Yeah. Okay, so, question number two. Which of the following can be considered a field mark? Nesting sites, weight of a bird, wing bars, or diet? That's going to be wing bars. Yeah, the wing bars is definitely the right answer. Well, that's a good go too, because you both got it right. The wing bars is the correct answer. That's a field mark, because some birds are almost identical. Field marks can aid in a correct bird identification. So, a uh, smart decision, guys. You could find those birds a lot better than an unknown birder. Okay, let's get to the third question. Which of these once thought extinct species was recently found to be alive in North America? I think we might have a clue on this one. The Carolina parakeet? No. The passenger pigeon? No. The Bachman's warbler? No. Or the ivory-billed woodpecker? <laughs> I knew I knew you guys would get that one. That was I almost you know, I, I when I saw that I was thinking, <laughs> should I? Well, maybe I should because I want to see if we're on the same page. I, I like the sort of atmosphere that um, <laughs> that's created in in the um, a studio like that. So question four. Which of the following can be found in a marsh area? The American Pippet, the American Robin, the American Tree Sparrow, or the American Coot? Now, Zan, I'm going to take a little um, the American this question. 
Because while the American Crute is the correct answer, I actually have seen American Pippets uh, in marshes. You have? On a number of occasions, not even once. This is something I see uh, pretty regularly. Wow, well, um, that's a, a good question. Um, but I'm going to actually give you half a point on that one because it was the American Coot. Um, often mistaken for a duck, this is a dark gray and black bird that has a whitish beak. So, uh, I'm going to say on that one, Tim has four points. You're now down to 3.5, unfortunately. So that, that, so the, uh, the half point that I lost, uh, just to keep this straight, was, uh, for choosing the right answer, but then acknowledging that, um, one of the other options could have been a contender. Well, and unfortunately, um, this is, this is judges' rules, so. Question five, uh, what species is not named for its call? Are you ready for this? The Eastern Screech Owl. The Gray catbird, the says Phoebe, and the mockingbird. Uh, I would have to go with the gray catbird on this one. Interesting decision. Because it is known for, for mimicry. Oh, but, but it does owl. mimic cows. Screech owl. Interesting. It mimics cats, that's... I changed okay, my so answer. Okay, so you going with Screech Owl, Martin? I'm going with the Screech Owl. Okay. Uh, I'm going to change my answer to the, the Phoebe. Okay, you're going with Phoebe. Phoebe. Okay. Yeah. So, for this question, unfortunately, for you, Martin, it was the Says Phoebe. That is not named for its call. It's interesting because the Says Phoebe actually does make a sound like a Phoebe. Very fascinating, isn't it? These judges, um, uh, I, I unfortunately can't reverse any of their decisions, so you will not be getting a point for that. Um, that. So Tim is now in the lead with five points on Martin's 3.5 points. So, question six. Which of the following can help make a positive identification of a species? This is judges' rules, Martin. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid... That is the... says... Phoebe! Phoebe! Very fascinating. Alright, that's enough of that. Let's put it away. I told you not to bring your phone into the, uh... Maybe if you put it on silent, you should keep bring it in here, but... Not... Today, or... We're gonna have to talk about this after the show. Alright, so question six. Which of the following can help make a positive identification of a species? Habitat. Voice. Behavior. Or all of the above. above. Okay. Uh, let's see if you guys are correct on that one. You're right. The status and range are also factors in proper identification. That was a toughie, guys, and you got it right. Okay, question seven. Which of these birds can imitate the human voice, the mute swan, the foster's turn, the blue jay, or the Thayer's goal. That would be the Blue Jay. Uh, Corv, uh, Corv, uh, Vids definitely, um, can mimic, uh, human, human sounds, and I don't, uh, know of any of those other species, uh, being able to do that, so I'm gonna have to go with the Jay as well. Interesting decision, guys. Uh, you are correct on that. Uh, crows, mockingbirds, and ravens are all good talkers, um, as well as blue jays, so they can speak <coughs> like, a, like a human does. Um, yes. So, uh, with that, I'm going to go on to question eight. The black-necked stilt and the American avocet can be found where? On the shore. In shallow water. Roaming the sand dunes, more than ten miles offshore, or perching in dead trees? Well, certainly not perching in dead trees. They, both the avocet and the other shorebird was, remind me again, Zan. The black neck stilt. The black neck stilt. So both of those are, sh are um, shorebirds. Uh, each of them actually has particularly long legs for walking through shallow water at the shore. So, I will go, um, 
with shallow water. Tim? Uh, I'm going to go with that as well. Okay. Well, uh, good, good, good go, guys. Um, because that was correct, um, both those birds can be found in shallow water. And Ben Ben 22 um, he adds after that point, he says, both of these birds have long legs and small bodies, which is an interesting fact as well. Okay, so question number nine. Owls can only be seen at night. True or false? False. false. That's a pretty easy one, guys. It was false. Many night birds can actually be spotted at any time of the day. I'd also like to point out that um, not all owls are nocturnal. So, for instance, the northern pygmy owl is a fully diurnal owl. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I know the, the short-eared owl as well. May, maybe not fully diurnal, but uh, is often spotted. Dawn and dusk. Dawn and okay, dusk. Okay, interesting. Those are very, very fascinating things to say, guys. And I will tell you, your scores are not that close this round. Uh, Tim, you got eight points. Martin, you have 6.5 points. But you're in luck. Because this last question is a three-pointer. That's enough to boost you above Tim's score of eight points. Sorry to do this to you, Tim. But... This question has one more rule. After I'm done listing each option, the person to say the, the, the option first makes that option no longer accessible to the next player. So this is kind of a crapshoot, guys. There are, there, are, there are four options here. I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trip them after I say the question. And whoever gets it first locks that, locks that answer in. So... So can we blurt it out right after you can, each? You must each... blurt it out after all four options are stated. But after not before. All four options. But not, not before, before. Not before. Got it. Not before will be immediate disqualification. Okay, so this is question 10. This is so-called for all the marbles, guys. The Ding Darling Wildlife Refuge is located where? Greenland. Cape May. Sanibel Island, Florida. Or Catalina Island. So, so, I I so to, to, since we got that one right, we're going to have to go on to a second question. This is going to have the same lock-in rule as last time. Are you ready for this? you got to answer after four. So, which bird has eyes facing forward instead of on the side of their heads like most birds? Ready? Eagle? Owl? <laughs> falcons? Or hummingbirds? Oh. Well, that was a very fascinating, uh, uh, so it looks like Tim Lockie and Al, Dave, do you, have a, do you have a choice then? You know, Zan, I'm kind of getting a little thrown off by uh, the creator of these questions. There's kind of a lot of incorrectness. Um, eagles um, also have their eyes facing much more forward than passerines. So you're going right. with the eagles on this question? Well, owls also have just a web, The forward. question requires just a one word answer. I'm going to abstain. You're going to abstain. You can't abst abstain. You're, in the, you're taking part in the quiz. You can, if you abstain, then you're automatically going to pick the first question. I think as a matter of principle, um, I'm not going to participate in this quiz anymore. Well, you already... Okay, so you automatically participate. So... Um, eagles, which was incorrect. It was owls. Tim, you got that correct. You got a three point added on to your eight point five or eight point lead. So that brings you up to eleven points. Um, unfortunately, Martin, I don't know what he had. He had like maybe one point one or one point two, something like that. But um, <clears throat> with that, I think we have to take a brief uh, break here. Martin, you want to take us out? Uh, yeah, maybe he's maybe he's in too bad of a mood to take us out. I think maybe I'll have to take us out on this one. And we'll be right back. Get out there and go, Bert.
this very special episode of Aviary Paragraph. I would like to conclude this episode by briefly getting the inside peep on the mind of the bird and the mind of the birder and discussing this sort of uh, this sort of thing um, with our two storytellers here, a prominent ecologist and prominent birder in um, our Northwest uh, community. Uh, you got anything special planned for us when you go into the mind of a bird here, Martin? I really do, Zan. No. I really do. Okay, that's good. Uh, Tim, anything special planned or sneak peeks? Any sneak peek? For our, uh, our my story, yeah. Uh, well, let's just say it uh, something for the holidays, you could say. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. Um, I just have a brief story that I'm gonna uh, say. I was hanging out with um, Jason. This isn't exactly have to do with birding, I guess, but we were hanging out. He he had his uh, shoe shoelaces were untied. I kept on pointing out to him. I said, "Hey, your shoelaces. That's dangerous. Maybe you should just, uh, tie your shoelaces." He said uh, that those were that they were just actually decorative laces. He had a pair, he had a pair of shoes on, and this is, I've never seen a pair of shoes like these. These things have apparently this is decorative shoelaces are out there now. So I just thought that was pretty fascinating. So I just wanted to bring that up. I don't know if you guys are wearing decorative shoelace shoes, but uh, Jason's got a pair, and um, they're pretty cool. I mm. might I was thinking about maybe going on Amazon, maybe buy, maybe possibly seeking those out. I might try and pick those up on eBay for. Um... Yeah, you may, or another resource of the internet like Craigslist. Craigslist, yeah. certainly. Yeah. But definitely, but to, to each each their own, you yeah. know. I support it. Totally. So, uh, Martin, I can tell by the look on your face that you are ready to get into the mind of a bird. Um, you wanna you wanna uh, help us out here? It's first light, and like every morning, when the sun comes up, the first thing I can see through the branches. High in this Douglas fir is the mud flat, the most southern point of Puget Sound. This is the time when I look to left and I look to right and I see all of my kind. Hundreds, one day even over a thousand, but we will disperse quickly. We fly, we take to the sky and move. I move with a known group, flying just to the northeast, and then we quickly change direction. We go, foraging for whatever food we may find. Our black wings glisten against the blue sky as the sun has risen further, and we begin foraging. Garbage, carrion, fish, it's all the same to us food that fuels our day. As I continue flying, I know that something is in store. The day passes uneventful until what's this I spy? Over. No, there. Yes, there. You can see it too. Two ducks. sight I've seen every day. Nothing out of the ordinary, except, yes, no, yes, you can see it, but you can't believe your eyes. Between the two ducks, a stick, and what's that? Holding on to the stick? It can't be, but it is a tortoise. I must fly, I must fly, I must fly, I must fly. I come closer to the ducks. They can't quite escape me. Something within my very character compels me to call out. And I say to the tortoise, with a slight smile, half cocked on my beak, you sir must be the king of the tortoises to be here in the sky. And tortoise falls into my trap opens his beak from around the stick and says yes as he falls plummeting flightless 
Dow forever. That's my story, Jen. Wow, that was um, a suspiciously. Um, I feel like I may have heard that one before. Yeah, it's it's that was a suspicious, very, very familiar story. It has kind of a tone, but told in a spectacularly yeah. visual way. Well, I thought too uh, that the crow must have been pretty happy that the tortoise fell because then it go out and eat the eat the tortoise. That is a good yeah. meal if you're a crow. Yeah. So um. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Tim, uh, I, f- I figure you might want to uh, take us in the mind of a birder at this point, if you have any birding stories about that. Or... Yeah, so um, I'm going to take us back two months, or a month and a half ago, two months ago. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, you know, this is middle of December. I'm driving around, think, try, racking my brain, thinking what to get my parents Okay, yeah. I, you know, I want to get them something thoughtful, something, maybe some birding gear. Yeah, yeah something to enrich their lives. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, you know, they have this beautiful backyard, big hazelnut trees. Hazelnut. They have no bird feeder back there. Huh. So well, they are not one of the 65 million people currently feeding birds? They are not. They, they had an old, old bird feeder that hadn't been filled in my lifetime and I grew up there um, Interesting. so what I did is I went down to uh, Wild Birds Unlimited okay. and picked up a, a wooden and glass bird feeder and about a 10 bag 10 pound bag of bird seed and I drove it up to uh, Redmond Washington and uh, gifted it to them for Christmas which you know at first I was you know hoping for a little bit more when they opened it up they seemed a little underwhelmed uh which i was a little bit disappointed in but uh you know they they seemed like they were looking forward to giving it a try um that's great yeah so i helped my my dad set it up out in the hazelnut trees had it great. hanging nice uh yeah, make sure well, squirrels don't get yeah the well nice. well high off the ground well i mean this the squirrels love those, yeah, they love those hazelnut trees, so, um, but he, he said, uh, you know, when I was, I, I helped Great. them set it up Great. there, and I was up Great. there for a couple of days, and we didn't get any hits in the birds, and I was, you know, a little disappointed, a little worried, honestly, Great. that it was going to be, uh, you know, dud, but, uh, about Great. two weeks ago, my dad calls me up, and he says, hey, uh, you know, where did you buy that, that bird seed? That, that big bag of bird seed you got and I you know I said well the bird bird birding supply store uh, in my area and he's like oh I guess I'll have to look for a place up here I need to get another bag of that and I, I said what you you threw the bag already and he, he said yeah in a, in a month you know it took him a couple a couple you know a week or two but but he had what, seen birds using food. yeah once once they found it, he said it was pretty much constant. I'm gonna do you constant bird right? activity throughout the day. There's a video series that I think your dad might enjoy. It's called uh, A Bird in the Hand. Now, Martin actually showed me this, which I, I can see him kind of grinning, but also kind of uh, hesitant. That's grimacing. Saying. Yeah, grimacing is more likely to think. But I, I would suggest this for your dad. You can actually learn how to get some of these wild birds to eat in your hand. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, and say that uh, instead of your dad watching those videos, those unethical, questionable, dubious videos, I think we here at Aviary Paragraph should sponsor your dad's bird feeder. Wow. I'm going to go out there and uh, say that I, I think we should... Want to pick up some some seed for pops? We're going to pick up some seed for pops. I think... uh, We're going to do a a section called Seed for Pops. Yeah. We call pops, and he tells us what birds are at the feeder. That's a great idea. Yeah, I think... uh, I think next next time I go up there, I'm going to bring up um, a copy of my Sibley's Field Guide. I have the Sibley's app, which, you know... 
far superior to oh, yeah, paper yeah. text. Oh, like the ebook awesome. version. Exactly. Right. That's why it's superior. Um, of course. But uh, so I'm going to bring that up for him to look through. Um, bring up a big, another big bag of bird seed, and yeah. Uh, yeah. you know. My goal is to turn my parents into a couple birders. Full fledged birders. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty, pretty dang neat. Strap them into the bird watching and then spread the love around. around. Pull yeah. them into birding, without a doubt. Well, I gotta say this has been a fun and kind of a, a little bit of a exciting um, show. My heart's pumping. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I got my adrenaline is, right. is rushing right now. There was I got like when I look back at this show, I'm thinking almost that maybe at some points you guys got too emotional. Um, but I think that on the whole, I think we did pretty well this show. I mean, uh, they can reach out to us, uh, those who are listening on our Twitter, Angel Fire, Angel Fire, of course, Facebook, Angel Fire website, um, Facebook. Um, email us. Email us, aviaryparagraph at gmail.com. YouTube we'd love, us. We'd YouTube. love to hear Leave from a you. comment, subscribe, yeah, subscribe, like, share. Please yeah. like. Yeah, like everything. All right. Please. So with that, um, sort of uh, got to pump the pro- promos, I guess. Um, I'm just going to say uh, adios. Um, and I think on this episode, I think we, you know what, I think we're all going to have to end the show with the same thing, which is get out there and go bird. This is Martin Salinas, and, uh, actually, this is Tim Luckley, and, uh, get out there and go bird. Martin Salinas, get out there and go bird. Jet, black hair, black hair. jet black eyes. She's jetting back home tonight, Jet Black surprise. Jet Black heels, fish net holds. Under the moon, she blooms like a Jet Black rose. Satin skin, tender to the touch. Velvet kisses that I miss. Thank you.